I was trying to figure out what is common between the two of you, and it struck me that what is common is unlike this morning where things were a little gloomy and a little kind of, um, you know, things are not going well, glass is half empty. Both of you seem like really contrarian, and I'll get to why I say that. Pankaj, in your case, it looks like while the tiger globals and the soft banks and all are kind of having second thoughts, Bertelsmann Ventures and you are having your busiest year in a long time. Right. What is it that you are seeing that others are not seeing? Um, so I'll be very honest with you. To be honest, I actually would kind of word it a little differently. It's probably something that they are seeing that I have not seen. Uh, one of you will be right sooner or yeah, later. Yes, so one right. of us will, you know, would be right. Uh, and by the way, all uh, the, the names that you kind of talked about are good friends of mine. Sure, I, yeah. I keep on meeting them on a regular basis. And you know, they have their reasons of, uh, of investing or not investing in the country. Uh, I feel that those reasons are more internal to themselves than what's happening in the, in the market in general. Um, when a lot of people said that we don't want to invest in India, the first thing that you do is you go and try and understand what's happening on the macroeconomic side, what's happening in the sector, etc. And we did not find any trend economically which kind of suggests that there should be a downturn. Okay. If that's the case, you start investing. And that's what we have been doing essentially. So just give a couple of examples of what so, you've done. So I think, uh, so, so to be honest, uh, we, own, we are a Series B, Series C specialist. We do anywhere between three to five deals a year. We try to find aspiring leaders, invest behind them, and hopefully they become leaders of their segments that change their sub-segments, et cetera, and hopefully can, can be a half a billion to three, four billion dollar entity in five, six years' time. That's our broad theme. Now, in 2015, where everybody was investing, we actually did only one deal. That's it. Uh, we th felt the valuations were very high. We could not compete. If, if people want to invest at high valuation, it's the winner's curse. Let them take it. I think one, one year old Bertelsmann can have a little bit of gray hair to understand and have that wisdom. Hopefully, we do. Uh, but 2016, when valuations did come down, but the macroeconomic climate has not changed at all, I think we are, we are investing. And this year, we have done Trebo, we have done Cart Rocket. Ankit was on the, on the uh, panel earlier. We did, uh, and, and Rahul from Trebo is going to be on the panel later. We did Lending Cart, uh, we did Reposo, and so on. So we are continuing investing. We might do a couple of more deals this year. So in general, I, yes, we, we, we might even do more than four or five deals that we do this year. And, and we are enjoying the bit. Subo, you went from being on the other side, right, where you were at Bessemer for 10 years. You wrote a lot of checks. You did fairly well. And when everything seemed to be going south in some ways, you decided to do a startup. Last year, you jumped ship, and you, uh, it's about a year, a little over a year old. You also turned an angel investor. You've put in, I guess, uh, money into about 10 yeah. companies or so, which is, again, very contrarian, right? Because if you believe everything, it's the wrong time to be in startup. It would have been good to be on the other side. What is your perspective um, in terms of making that shift, and what do you see that others are not seeing in terms of saying, you know what, even if the funding situation may not be great, the opportunity is still there to do a startup in kind of the fintech space? Yeah, so uh, my view is uh, venture investing is probably the best job in the world. Uh, the only thing that trumps venture investing is that of a successful entrepreneur. And I decided to make the trade to see if I can become a successful entrepreneur. And successful is a very, very loaded word. You know, success means different things to different people. And uh, so 2015, I, I saw a real opportunity in the business that I wanted to start, which is in financial services. Uh, internet penetration, whichever numbers you take had reached a certain threshold, and there was a real opportunity to deliver serious value to customers. Uh, and I found put together a good team. I said, look, if now not, if not now, never. Let me take the plunge. And uh, it's been a year. It's been going pretty well. Uh, and I, as, as you said, along the process, I also do angel investing. Uh, when I do investing, I tend to take more business model and market risks and not competitive risks. Like, I tend to stay away from investing in in a business where there are t 10 people who are trying to do the same thing, whereas somebody who's trying to come up with a new business model that's not existed. Uh, you know, that's the risk effectively I can take with a small check. Uh, my firm view is uh, I'm a long-term bull on the consumer internet. Uh, in spite of all the negatives that we've heard over the last one year, depth of the market, funding, all the thing, I think over the next five to 10 years, we are going to create large, valuable companies. 
uh, whether it is five or 50, unknown. But there will certainly be valuable companies. Uh, there will be a healthy M&A environment that will come into three, four in, in the next three, four years. So I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, complete bull as far as consumer internet market in India is concerned. And you've been able to, you've raised one round, looks like you're about to raise another one. So has it been, from this side of the fence, has it been a little bit more challenging? Are you getting asked more difficult questions by people willing to write checks? Yeah, I think if I have to describe in one sentence, I think the discussion from 2015 to 2016, the discussion has shifted from momentum to unit economics. Last year, it was all about momentum. What's your monthly growth rate? How many customers you're adding? What's your momentum? Growth, 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 nothing else. This year, any VC you meet, any, you know, probably Pankaj would corroborate that is, okay, how much do you spend to acquire the customer? How much do you get lifetime value? So I think basically discussion has shifted from uh, momentum to unit economics. Uh, that's a big shift. As a result, any young company, when it's trying to find a product market fit, may not have the unit economics in place. As a result, there'll be slightly longer struggle to, you know, sort of raise money. And we did, we did go through our own uh, struggle in terms of being able to convince uh, investors, but thankfully, you know, we made it uh, at the end. So if you're a startup, uh, clearly it's an interesting dilemma, right? One is to slow down spending because, you know, raising money has become a little difficult and don't blow all your money. That's one challenge. The other aspect could be get to the milestones faster because that's the way to get more money, right? So it seems like these are somewhat contradictory poles. So first of all, is this how you kind of uh, talk to startups and say that do, you have to do both these? And how do you kind of tell them to manage these kind of so, seemingly divergent pulls. So I, I think, first of all, a, a lot of uh, investors have different views on how to go about uh, balancing these two variables of growth versus looking at profitability at a, at a certain unit level. Um, the way we try to do it is that we are absolutely fine with growth. We don't want to see unit economics, provided that is a category where unit economics can come tomorrow. But if you are spoiling the consumer behavior by giving huge amount of discounts and you are unit economic negative, and we also know that while in the US that turn, that shift, uh, that shift happened and people started uh, paying, India is not US. And that will never happen in India. We are the most stingy people, uh, one of the stingy people, uh, set of people on the planet. If you start getting consumers addicted to discounts, they will never change their behavior in that specific category. We would avoid that uh, strategy at all. We would want to build it uh, properly with uh, part to profitability from day one. So food would have been a good example. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think uh, uh, in terms of food, we don't like, so anything which is commoditized, we don't like uh, discounting in general. Uh, which kind of goes against what has happened in India in horizontal e-commerce, uh, food to a certain extent, while there could be differentiation, etc., in the quality of food, etc., but the dal makhni is a dal makhni, and half of the people are ordering, uh, are kind of uh, giving that, etc., so that does become a commodity to a certain extent. We don't want to fight that force. And over there, you should have unit economics from day one, but if it's a highly commoditized, so if it's a highly unique setup, um, your, your offering is quite differentiated, and you know that they, by virtue of that, you'll end up getting unit economics fixed over a later point. Go for growth today. So just a quick follow-up. Um, so by that definition, to pick a couple of examples, you're willing to let a pepper fry or a savan still spend for growth because the... Yes, so I think savan is a great example and we are investors there. Um, Savan, the only way you can get advertising money is when you get a critical mass of users. Right. Um, there's no point of, you can't be profitable, you can't even have revenue if you don't have a bundle of consumers to sell to brands. So you, the faster you reach there, the faster you make money, the faster you're profitable. So I think that actually is a very good example of a business which is on the other side of e-commerce where growth will mean a lot for unit economics. So do you want to add anything or should I kind of switch you to the angel part of it? No, so I, you know, uh, managing cash flow situation burn is a, is a daily challenge for a startup. And I think if you look at the money that startups spend, uh, I think you can broadly bug into two parts. One is customer acquisition, which is marketing. And marketing could in turn be media or it could be incentivization. Uh, the other big bucket is uh, manpower. <coughs> so uh, based on my venture investing as well as my own startup experience, one firm view and a very strong view that I've come to uh, is uh, in India, 
when we see a market opportunity and we see a lot of work to be done, we throw bodies, we hire people. So if you look at all the sore stories that have happened in India startup, you'll realize the companies bend down because they increase burn and they increase burn by hiring lots and lots of people. Right? So uh, one thing I've learned is if you see problems, don't hire people. Make existing people more productive. And as a CEO, you know, one needs to have a very, very strong focus on headcount. Headcount needs to be under control. If you, every rupee that you save on headcount, spend on marketing. You would rather acquire customers than employees. Uh, and that's something that I tell all my companies, and we try to practice at uh, Fisdom as well. The other, uh, clearly adding employees, and that seems to be a common trend among startups that have kind of crashed and burned. But the other trend seems to be this idea that you can start in Bombay, Delhi, but somehow you need to be in 25 cities in the next six months, even though it doesn't, 60%, 70% of the market is actually Bombay, Delhi for that kind of business. That seems to have been driven also, actually, some of the blame seems to have been, can be attributed to people who are funding them, right? Yeah, has that changed? Are people are willing to kind of fund a startup now and say four cities is fine for the next two years? So I, I think, yes, I think the general uh, thesis is correct. Uh, um, if you start in a few cities and you want to now get investors to invest at a crazy valuation, um, either the, the management team wants it or because the competition has done it or the investors want to get markups of what they've uh, invested on, et cetera, um, the only way to show that is by, by adding new cities. Um, knowing very clearly that those cities, the consumer behavior in those cities may not be ready for your service. And therefore, we have seen situations where you have uh, a product which is being delivered or can be delivered to about, let's say, even 300 cities, but the 80% the of the sales are coming from the top five, six cities, et cetera. So I think uh, that is a big issue. Uh, the issue is uh, when you end up in Series D, Series E, that growth will never come that you're promising to the new investors, and then you start having down downs and so on. Um, our view is that we need to kind of understand how deep the markets are in these sub-clusters. Uh, now, that may not be four cities. That might be 10 to 12 cities in India. Uh, and after that, there's a big vacuum. And that is how India is built in intrinsically. So we should not try to change that. It will take time for uh, rural India to come up. And, and we will build a very valuable, valuable business over, over time. But that's not going to happen today. And I think by, by all means, management and investors should not go down that path. Let's talk about angels. For, sorry. I think, I think uh, going, you know, uh, 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 exactly uh, 18 months ago, uh, VCs would actually push people to go out to more cities, show me growth. Uh, and exactly the conversations today when, a, you know, a company that can potentially be in 10 cities goes to a VC, the VC is telling him, okay, show me your unit economics in one city and then I'll fund you for the other three cities. So that's the difference in conversations that's happened between VCs and in, uh, entrepreneurs. Clearly, there's um, a lot of... Um hope that angels will somehow fill the vacuum of funding. And it seems like a bunch of, you've done 10 of them. But the angels in India also have a pretty bad reputation, right? You write a five lakh check and you act like you own the company, right? They're like difficult to deal with. They don't go away. They're annoying and all of that as well, right? Is there an angel bubble, uh, you think? And you think that that might also kind of explode a bit first before it settles down? So I think there is a, there is an angel bubble for sure. Uh, it may not be of the same proportion as the 2015 VC bubble, uh, you know, investing bubble. Uh, the reason I say there is angel bubble is people are uh, getting into f companies almost with a certainty that this is going to become a large company. Uh, the way angel investing works is unless you create a portfolio of 10, 15, 20 companies, it's almost you're losing money. You know, the odds of each succeeding is 1%, less than 1%. Uh, so people who are, who are who genuine angel investors are creating portfolio of 15, 20, 30 companies. Uh, whereas, you know, some people who are investing based on relationship, look, he was my colleague at McKinsey and he's starting, let me put, you know, 10 lakhs. I think those experiences will sort of, you know, will become bad over a period of time because one-off investing for you to get well, you have to be lucky. Even in venture investing where these guys do series B and C, they create a portfolio so that, you know, as a portfolio, they generate return. So angel investing also, it's critical that you create a portfolio versus, you know, doing one-off investing. So what kind of an angel are you? 
So I, I have a portfolio. Right, you know. But I meant like, are you like very involved? Are you do write a check and trust the people or? Yeah, so I think trust is inherently critical in an angel situation. I mean, you have to believe the, the guy is not going to take the money home and you know, spend it for the right reasons. I generally involve myself in the companies to the extent that I can, uh, you know, help him in thinking through several situations. Uh, it has two benefits, you know, it hopefully helps the company, it helps me actually staying in touch with what's happening in the ecosystem. Uh, so I end up meeting at least once a month and, uh, you know, spending an hour or two on uh, what's happening in the company, trying to help. So fairly involved, I would say. Ankash, do you think out of the scarcity of money, I mean, there's a lot of money sitting there, right. but there's scarcity for people looking to get it. Do you think new funding, um, not platforms, but new funding methods will perhaps become bigger? There's a session this afternoon about venture debt, for example. Right. Just as an angel, do you see any other new things coming out of the problems that regular people are not funding? So I, I think in general, we will see certain new types of uh, funding venture debt as a classic example, and I know all the three companies that are on the panel today. Uh, but we, we will go through a journey with that as well. Mm -hmm. The first thing that a lot of these companies are doing is backing the winners, we, which already has a lot of money by saying that we are cheaper than the VCs. If that is the strategy that they're taking for the next two, three years, it is only helping the good companies, the average companies which can become good companies still don't have capital. So I think there would be a, 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 a disconnect between uh, companies that should get that capital versus uh, funds that are funding uh, other companies which, which actually have too much capital and so on. And they're just bulking them up for competition and so on. Uh, I think it will take anywhere between three to five years uh, for some of these structures to become large enough to then trickle down into the ecosystem and fund companies that actually require it. So I think there is going to be a challenge for companies raising monies uh, from alternate structures, etc. cetera. Um, angel investing, I believe, is actually an alternative way to do that now. As and, and, and when, I, when I talk about angel investing, I don't mean the traditional angel investing of writing a small check. A lot of very good entrepreneurs who will over time do M&A and make millions of dollars, companies which would have positive cash flows will start funding their ecosystem to build a network. And I think that can be an alternative way of funding, um, let's say, average company which is trying to be a great company but, but is not getting support from traditional methods like VCs and so on. You, you've talked about sectors that you won't get into, um, but out of the ashes of some of the first experiments, right, whether it's like food or areas that a bunch of companies went in, most of them got burned, is there an opportunity for somebody else to kind of rethink this and kind of say, you know, there's a new way of doing this, smarter, smaller, but, or is food, for example, pretty much burnt for a long time? Indians eat a lot of food. Oh, absolutely. So I think any, any uh, sector which has a lot of consumption going on are large sectors to disrupt and build biz big businesses. Um, if the first generation of companies could not do that, that doesn't mean that the second generations would not be successful. I mean, when you talk about e-commerce, now e-commerce today is in uh, the urban parts of India. Will there be a separate Flipkart Amazon for rural India? Or would that be a separate company? We don't know the answer to that. Similarly, with food, full stack companies continue to do far better than the, the, the other food companies which were aggregating and so on. So I think we need to figure out what are the right business models, what will work in a unique country like India, and, and build those models. And I think version two business models, are, they're definitely a lot more exciting than version one business models. There are, I mean, if you look in the, in the West, obviously there's a lot of enthusiasm around the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, analytics, data, and clearly in India there's a whole bunch of analytics companies that have come mm -hmm. about, and there's a lot of talk about at the earlier panel there was this Funkat said that if you say you have a bot, I'm not going to touch you, right? Obviously there'll be a bunch of young people wanting to get into AI, Internet of Things, analytics. Outside of that, if you were each one of you to pick like one sector where you think actually there is still a long, lot of headroom, nothing new has yet come about but can still come about, what would that be? So, so to be honest, I, I personally feel that we are still in the middle of the consumer internet journey. We are not over that yet. Okay. Uh, we, we are far behind 
uh, US and China in terms of realizing the the consumer internet dreams. Uh, a lot of the sectors, I mean, we were talking about it uh, earlier, including healthcare, etc. We've not seen innovations come in on that side. Agri-tech is another area where a lot of innovation is coming in and so on. So I think in general, consumer internet, also uh, B2B, um, uh, e-commerce, etc. Are, are places where horizontals have not been even built today. And after that, there's a story of verticals getting built, etc. Let's say in agriculture, B2B businesses, etc. There's a company called Ninja Card, etc., which is, which is funded, etc. Uh, that is doing well. So I think a lot of those themes are fairly prevalent and will become bigger in the next two, three years. Having said that, I think we uh, as Bertelsmann see a lot of innovation happening in IoT as well as in big data in China. We are actively investing over there. So we see strong trends coming over there. That would kind of come to India at some point. I don't think that would be big in the next two, three years. But after that, that might be quite big. But I could be wrong. So I, I completely agree. I think there are several sectors like healthcare, education, agri, uh, in fact, financial services as we speak. In fact, even in financial services, what's being done is scratching the surface. <clears throat> I think consumer internet has to has to penetrate a lot more verticals and sectors, if you will. Uh, so I think IoT, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, all these will be, in terms of volumes of companies, it will be very similar to B2B SaaS companies that you, we used to see three, four years ago. There'll be one-off company here and there. I don't, I don't expect to see 50 companies doing virtual reality in India next year, uh, and 10 of them getting funded. So the volumes will be still very high in, uh, you know, uh, consumer internet sectors. So, um, if in fintech, for example, uh, would you expect to see a bunch of like either big banks or startups trying to get into the whole robo advisory, for example, because that seems to be the trend in the West. Yeah, so FISDOM is in some sense a robo-advisor. Uh, so, so I think across uh, all types of lending, whether it is P2P lending, SME lending, consumer lending, uh, investment management, wealth management, uh, you know, personal finance management, I think each of these areas will have, will, we will see 30, 40 companies that will come up in the next one year, next two years. Uh, so, and that's just financial services. And, we, you know, we were speaking about healthcare. You know, except Practo, probably you haven't seen a single company in healthcare, right? There's so much to do. We have, you know, we have 50% people who get diabetes after the age of 40. So, so there's a huge opportunity in healthcare, I agree, which we will see over the next uh, couple of years. I mean, one of the great things in the last few years has been a lot of young people getting very excited about starting things, right? Which was not the case. People looked for IAS or jobs and all of that. Is there some concern that because of the sense that this first wave of startups are like really haven't taken off, that it'll dampen that enthusiasm, or do you actually not see that? Do you see still a lot of people saying, you know what, these guys didn't work, but we still can make this work? Macro question. So, so I, I think uh, making it work has multiple things in it. The first is, can we take a plunge and build a business, or, or build a team and an idea? Number two is, can we get it funded? Number three is, can we make it dominant? And number four, can we exit to make monies and therefore be role models for others to happen? Um, I feel the first three are happening. Um, we have now built a critical mass for these three stages to continue to happen over a longer period of time. The number fourth, which is exit, and, and it's the most talked about uh, topic uh, in, in all conferences, that has not happened yet. Our belief is that over time, that should happen. Um, China, there's a very robust ecosystem of M&A between the uh, traditional guys and the digital guys. Digital guys uh, between uh, um, Baidu, Tencent, and Alibaba buying a lot of companies. That has not happened in India. We hope that some of that, when it starts happening in India, will give the uh, kicker that the whole ecosystem and the, and the, and the entrepreneurship spirit um, uh, that is needed to, to kind of uh, make sure that other people take the plunge and then start businesses. About a year, year and a half ago, the benchmarks that people thought would trigger a big boom would be uh, an IPO of a Flipkart or you know, Snapdeal or one of these guys. Clearly, that is delayed, to put it mildly. Right. What would be the next trigger? What would kind of say, you know, Pankaj again in the earlier session said things could turn around in about 12 months. What does turnaround look like looking forward? What would trigger that? So, so oh, sorry. I, I hope, and I've not seen any activity of that, but seeing from China, wherever it's a hyper competitive market and you have multiple players that are 
building businesses, at least in China, they have joined hands to for form leaders, right. which then can be IPO'd. If in India we can't have IPO, IPO-able stories on standalone companies, these companies should leave their egos behind, the entrepreneurs should leave their egos behind, investors should push them to join hands and become large dominant players which can be IPO'd. I think without which, we, I think it's going to be a very difficult sell for, for, for getting an exit in this country. I think I completely agree. I think uh, exits are crucial for, for capital, consistent capital flow into India. Uh, companies like you know the unicorns, seven eight unicorns in India have taken in billions of dollars of capital. Uh, some part of it has to flow back, and I don't see that capital flowing back unless there is some consolidation in the marketplace. And my view is, you know, uh, the 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 market forces will force them to go through that uh, consolidation phase as opposed to uh, you know it will force the founders to drop their egos and actually do some merger and you know go take the company public. I think. As I said, I think some of these companies will go public. You know, will there will be some liquidity in the next? Uh, it might take three years, but it will happen. I think that's the next sort of trigger point for people to feel like, yeah, look, this sort of works. Three years is a long time. So, you mentioned egos. Are Indian entrepreneurial egos any different or somewhat bigger than what you see outside? I mean, you think the Chinese ego should be big, legitimately? Uh, that is true. I think the egos are the same. It's the self belief that we can execute in India uh, at a cheaper cost than merging. I think that concept, which is not about ego, but it's about self-confidence, and perhaps that is right. But all you are trying to do is create more competition, which is not helping anybody. I mean, take telecom as an example. Did we really need 12 or 13 telecom companies in India? Or probably three, four would have been good enough. They would have given the lowest tariff to the consumers and probably would have been valued a lot more. But we still went through a crazy war from 2003 to 2013. And now, after 10 years, we have some winners of Vodafone and, and uh, Air, uh, Airtels and so on, which are continuing to do well. Um, so I feel that entrepreneurs can keep their ego aside, but they should merge to get scale faster. Um, I hope that uh, VCs who have a limited uh, life of uh, 7 to 10 years in an investment uh, can put pressure to get liquidity, which can get the entrepreneurs to do the right things faster. I mean, Lee Fixel, who you know well personally, seems to drive a little bit of that, right? Some of his companies, so. well, yes. Somehow his companies seem to merge, let me put it that way, right? Um, so I think that's a good point. I think that's the smartest move from the entrepreneur side. I don't know how much the investors are doing there, but the smartest move from the entrepreneur side to consolidate and, and win. India is a hyper, hyper competitive market. Uh, there are clones that get built even four years after the first wave of entrepreneurs launch in a specific sector. It's best to get to critical mass and reach a dominant position um, and, and, and hopefully IPO and, and, and get uh, exits for everybody than keep fighting it for 10 years to see who is the eventual winner. Both of you are capitalists at heart, and I think I know what you'll say, but let me ask anyway. The government has done the GST thing. That's a big thing out of the way. If you were to ask of one thing, man, maybe you'll say stay out of it, but if you were to ask the government of one thing to help, because the Chinese government somehow or the other actually does seem to kind of influence mergers and does seem to kind of influence who stays in and who stays out, what would you like? I mean, each one of you. Is there one thing you would like this government to do? Um, so I think my view is that, yes, you know, while we may love for the government to shut doors for all strategics to come in and venture capitalists to make enough money, I don't think that's very Indian of us. That's never going to happen. So I don't think we should even wish for that. I think trying to uh, give enough uh, uh, leeway to startups to e improve ease of business and take away all as much as, they, as possible, the red tapism in, 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 uh, in, in, in the government departments, wherever startups inter interact with government departments, etc., is the only thing that I would expect from the government to do. And if they can pull it off, that will be a big win. Just to put you on the spot, in the last two years, have you noticed there's a lot of headlines about it? Yes. But reality, has that changing? No, no, it's not changed much in reality. There's a lot of talk about it, at least the bureaucrats take it uh, very positively. So the attitude shift is there, but actions in general have not changed. I think, <clears throat> I would say, uh, you know, technology has the power to disrupt uh, industries in a manner that regulations become redundant. I think if the government can do one thing, which is, you know, be adapted 
making regulatory changes to suit the technology changes. Uh, I think that will be one thing that the government can do. We've seen it in telecom, if you recollect. There were all kinds of licenses, state licenses, national licenses. So over a period of time, I think we've come to unified license. I think same thing will happen in financial services. It's happened in taxis. It will happen in healthcare, whenever healthcare kind of explodes in India, healthcare technology. I think if regulations can keep up pace with technology, I think that will be a... Uh, that would be awesome. To your second question, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't think there is any change on the ground in terms of ease of business. Uh, uh, but my point is, look, uh, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur, if you, have to, if you want to start the company, you might as well go through that grind of, you know, going through all the paperwork. You know, if you can't do that paperwork, how will you get customers? Suffering is a very Indian thing. Right? <laughs> uh, in, in the case of taxis, since you mentioned it, actually it looks like some of the actions are actually making it more complicated for the, both the Olas and the Ubers to do business the way they do business globally, right, is right. that. Uh, time is up, but I'll ask one last question. Um, a bunch of startup young people with ideas and maybe a little bit of a product, not much revenue are in this room. What would be one or two kind of pieces of advice that each of you would give? You're not in early at all, yeah. but still, um, if somebody comes up to you after and you're going to be mobbed after, what would, what would you say? Here are a couple of things based on the last three years for you to kind of do or don't do. Um, so, so first thing that I would say is if you don't have a co-founder, get a co-founder. Entrepreneurship is an extremely lonely journey and you, have, you hit highs and lows and uh, the more friends, the strong partners you have, the better it is for you. Number two, try to have a strong, clear vision on which you are trying to act on. Strategies change, pivots happen, all of that is fine, but that vision will drive you to the right place. And if you end up building the right team, I think everything else will follow. Well, um, ideas don't create valuable companies. It's the execution that matters. So don't fret too much about whether you have the billion dollar idea or not. Uh, once you jump in, you will figure out a way to take it to a billion dollar idea because you don't have an option. So don't think too much about whether you have the right idea or not. And second, keep your expenses low, both on the personal front as well as the company front. Don't spend, don't take a home loan, you know, don't hire people when you don't need them. Great. Uh, Pankaj, super, thank you so much. We could do this for another half hour and still not kind of wrap this up, but we're told time is up. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you very much.